In our basic physics and chemistry courses, most of us learn about the solid state of matter. And what we learn is that the solid state is a place of considerable structural diversity. We learn, for example, that solids can sometimes be uh, amorphous, exhibiting disorder over a relatively uh, long length scale, or that solids more commonly might exist as very regular ordered structures called crystals, in which we have a small uh, unit that's repeated infinitely uh, throughout space. That small unit, what we call uh, the unit cell, has a very, very predictable and regular arrangement of the basic constituents, and then we simply take that unit and we replicate it in order to form uh, the bulk crystal. Now, if we're talking about atomic solids, there usually only are a few basic structures that are stable under a given set of thermodynamic conditions. If we're talking about molecular solids, so crystals that are composed of molecules of different sizes, then there may be a fair number of different types of crystal structures that that molecule can form. That's a phenomenon that we call polymorphism. And um, it's that and uh, uh, just the general nature of crystal structures uh, that I want to talk about. Now, polymorphism is a very, very interesting phenomenon. And the first question that comes up is, well, why should we care about polymorphism? Well, if I'm a drug manufacturer, for example, then I care considerably about polymorphism. So drugs, uh, medications, are often created in the solid form, so as crystals. Uh, usually that is the, the phase that's the most stable, uh, it lasts a long time, it's the easiest to, uh, to transport, and so it's sort of the, the preferred form for, um, uh, for pharmaceutical industries to administer their, their compounds. The problem is that different polymorphs of a molecular compound can be more or less thermodynamically stable. And that has ramifications for the ability of the, the solid then to dissolve in the environment of your stomach, for example. So in other words, to come apart in water or in an acidic environment. There's a famous example of this, um, which is the anti-AIDS drug ritonavir. Now, this drug was originally marketed in the 90s uh, for the one structure, the one crystal structure that was known and it, it had a pretty good bioavailability and it was said that you only need to store these as uh, simple gel caps uh, on the shelf. But it turned out that there was another structure, another polymorph that was unknown at the time that the drug was marketed and the, 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 the marketed structure would convert from the created structure to a much more stable polymorph that then would fail to dissolve in solution, so in the environment of, uh, of the stomach. Uh, this is called failing the dissolution test. And unfortunately, that transition was a spontaneous one. It only took a very small seed of this other crystal structure, which sort of just naturally gets in in the manufacturing process, in order for the drug to undergo this conversion from the marketed form to the more stable form. And as a result, whole lots of the drug were failing this dissolution test and therefore they were not bioavailable. They were unable to, uh, to carry out the biological function they were designed to. So the drug had to be recalled and it took about four years after that in order to reform the manufacturing process so as to prevent this transformation from the marketed form to the more stable one. Uh, the second form was called Form 2 when it was discovered. And this problem of polymorphism, of the fact that one compound can convert to another one, can be a big problem for drug manufacturers if another polymorph turns out not to be bioavailable at the end of the day. This is something you'd like to be able to predict a priori before you go to market rather than having to deal with the expense and the, the bad PR of having to recall your drug and then uh, reformulate it. There are other examples where polymorphism is important if I'm, for example, interested in creating an organic semiconductor 
and my organic molecule can uh, exhibit or, or can, can crystallize into different forms. Those different forms may have different properties, right? so they may have uh, different conductivities and things like this. So this is something I would like to be able to know about my compound before I actually create a real product from it. The problem of studying crystal structures and polymorphism experimentally is of course that it's very, very difficult to know exactly what structure you're creating. It's hard to grow pure crystals. There can always be defects, there may be impurities. Uh, in fact, what governs the, the, the crystals that you get often is the method in which the, the crystal is made, whether you crystallize it out of solution, you grow it in some confined environment, these can influence what structures you actually get. So from that point of view, crystallization is, is rather difficult. And this is therefore an area where computational methods could potentially play an important role if they were sufficiently robust and accurate to predict crystal structures and their polymorphs, knowing only the formula for the compound. But this is an enormous challenge in computational uh, methodology, which is basically given only the formula of the molecule, predict for me what crystal structures it will form and give a thermodynamic ranking for them. Which are the most stable ones? And then what are uh, the next few most stable compounds? How many polymorphs are there in total? Uh, and are there ones that maybe only exist under uh, unusual thermodynamic conditions like very high pressure uh, or under confined conditions, whatever they may be. So this is something that we would like to be able to do and it's something that we've actually um, been working on uh, starting maybe around 2010, um, which is uh, to use techniques from computational chemistry to try to uh, predict crystal structures and polymorphs given only the molecular formula for um, the compound. The importance of this challenge, by the way, I should note, is, is so considerable that every few years there is a competition which is run by um, the Cambridge Structural Database, which is basically that. They create or they, they experimentally crystallize uh, a number of structures for a given set of target compounds, usually five or six of them, and then computational teams are set on the, the task of predicting what those structures are without knowing what the experimental results are. They get about a year to get their best candidates and then they're submitted and finally those results are compared to the experiment and the ones who get the closest of course then are, are the winners of this, this competition. And of course the, the reason for this competition is really to accelerate or to motivate these groups to develop the methods that are capable of carrying out this very, very significant challenge that can clearly Im impact the pharmaceutical industry, uh, various um, uh, industries and also uh, high energy materials, so um, explosives is a very important area for crystals and, and, um, and polymorphism. How do we approach this from the point of view of computational methods? Now, the problem of generating crystal structures and the polymorphs comes down to two things we need to be able to describe the interactions between the molecules with sufficient accuracy that we can predict what are often very, very small energetic differences between two different polymorphs. In many cases, those differences are only on the order of maybe a few times what we call chemical accuracy, which in technical terms is one kilocalorie per mole accuracy. And that's an energy, energy scale that's very, very difficult to get with current techniques. And then the other problem is to be able to sample enough configurations that we can get this thermodynamic ranking. Well, a very common way to predict crystal structures is to simply pack the molecules according to a particular arrangement. Now crystal structures there are two things that we have to specify in order to get, uh, in order to be able to describe the crystal. One is the size of that unit cell, so what are its parameters, what are the, the lengths and the various angles that um, make up that cell. 
And then the other thing is the set of transformations that tell us how to pack the molecules into the cell, which is called the space group. All right? So if I give you those parameters, then I have enough information to describe the crystal structure. So the, 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 a very common way to do it then is to take sort of the most commonly observed space groups and to pack the molecules according to the rules of that space group, which is just a set of transformations that tells you how, given one molecule, how to find the others in the unit cell. And that will give you a set of candidate structures that are usually far too many. All right? So not all of them are, thermodynamic rele are thermodynamically relevant. And so the next problem then is to be able to assign a ranking to them, and that's very, very difficult. So another way to do it is to use uh, microscopic techniques such as molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo where we sample a distribution or we solve the equations of motion and uh, from all the configurations sampled uh, we can get relative populations of the different structures and then that gives us our thermodynamic ranking. The problem here of course is that often the, trans the transition from one structure to another involves uh, a large energy penalty. In order to get all the molecules to rearrange from one structure to another structure usually involves very, very high energies. So we get into a problem what's called rare event sampling. And rare event sampling simply means that I have to wait a very long time for enough energy to amass in one particular mode that like, governs this reorientation in order to observe the transformation from one structure to another. And this is something that we've been working on for, uh, I would say, for a number of years, which is how to incorporate rare events into our computational techniques, something we've been able to do. And it basically involves targeting a few key variables in our system that we think can distinguish the different crystal structures. For example, the shape of the unit cell is certainly one, um, and the molecular orientations is certainly another, the way the molecules pack and they orient. And if we target these variables in a particular way, in our approach, for example, we, uh, we accelerate the sampling along these directions using uh, a higher temperature, and uh, then we have a way to sort of correct for that high temperature bias that we apply. And that allows us then to predict free energies, which is simply the work needed to create this transformation from one structure to another. That allows us to give us the relevant th thermodynamic ranking of our system. So using approaches like this, we've been able to predict uh, the polymorphs of a number of fairly simple compounds without having, to, uh, without having in any input from experiment. We only know the molecular formula of the compound. What we want to do going forward here is to uh, be able to predict crystal structures for molecules that are larger, that have some internal uh, flexibility, which adds new degrees of freedom because then they can undergo conformational changes in different crystal structures, and then to be able to predict um, the structures of more complex things. For example, there's a lot of interest now in co-crystals. These are systems in which two compounds actually crystallize together. In pharmaceuticals, this might be the biologically active molecule crystallizing with some sort of excipient that helps to stabilize the structure. Um, in uh, high energy materials, co-crystals uh, are often uh, used because of their thermally uh, labile. And, um, and then the, the other challenge that we need to, to overcome is this problem of describing the interactions uh, accurately enough to get these small energy differences. Now, there are ways to do this by creating effective models in which we use very, very accurate calculations on small, um, uh, small examples, so maybe two molecules together or three molecules together, creating a dimer or a trimer, and then turning that into an effective model. Or we can use first principles calculations where we use the uh, electronic structure to predict what the forces are between the, the molecules in our system. And improving uh, not only the efficiency, but our ability to, uh, to do those kinds of calculations accurately is certainly going to be extremely important going forward. So these two challenges, being able to handle the rare event problem and with enough degrees of freedom to describe both flexibility of molecules 
and uh, orientations and the shape of the unit cell and the accuracy of uh, how we, we calculate the forces. These are going to be the main challenges that we need to address if we really want to be able to predict crystal structures computationally from these first principles types of, uh, of approaches, which is a very, very important problem in so many areas of, uh, of chemistry and physics.